applicable, if anything, that ends up being workable or applicable. So a range of possible things that you might be modeling. I mean, what are you modeling if, if you're going to recreate a conscious mind on a computer? Some people would say that basically as long as you've got the abstract function of what your brain is doing being replicated, then that's enough. Okay? Um, so at a high level, it doesn't matter what all the... Um, <coughs> Um, if, if you've got um, states A and B that feed into state C, so whatever state C is, this higher state is dependent on what A and B are doing, it doesn't matter if you model A and B as long as you can accurately model state C and the way it changes. Okay. Um, other people would say, well, if you do that, there can be sort of bottom-up effects that you're going to miss. There'll be vital things in the simulation that are missing, and whatever the outcome is, essentially you won't be modeling real human mental activity. So the next slightly less abstract level of that is to say, okay, well, we'll model actual physiology, but we're not going to model it at the level of individual neurons. We'll, ind uh, we'll model large aggregates of neurons, maybe organs within the brain. Now, you do get stuff like this happening in the real world, world now. Um, I, seem, I, I seem to remember, I think it was a hypothalamus um, chip basically, wasn't it? Modeling, basically um, reading the inputs and correlations between the inputs and outputs to a person's hypothalamus. And so if the hypothalamus was, was destroyed, then you could basically replace its function with a chip. Now that's the, that's the equivalent of modeling large-scale neural aggregates. Now, philosophers will have fits over this for the next 50 years, I'm sure. But the fact of the matter is that those very few people who have had their hypothalamus replaced with a chip, um, report perfectly um, good phenomenology, you know, they, they say everything's great, it's doing, you know, their memories are working the way it didn't before they had the chip implanted, that kind of thing. But there are issues, which we're going to get to in a few more, uh, 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 in a little while. But the two obvious ones are, well, what if you wouldn't expect them to report anything wrong um, if you replaced it with a chip? What if, what if the hypothalamus was, it had nothing to do with consciousness, so of course they're just going to go, I feel fine, I'm still me. And also, what if they're suddenly, you know, this is an extreme and ridiculous scenario, but what if they're suddenly a zombie? What if there's no conscious life in their head whatsoever, but at the moment their hypothalamus was destroyed, there's just an automaton that says, hey, I feel fine, I'm conscious. In fact, they're lying. Okay. Sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. I the hypothalamus communicates with the maturity of life. Yeah, I mean, it can be quite long, yeah. Yeah, but I mean, the, the, the point I'm making here is that you basically, whether it's hypothalamus or any other area, there's large aggregates of neural activity <coughs> being modelled in a lump. The next level, and this is kind of a common one, is people say, okay, we will model the function of every individual neuron, which is no mean feat, um, given that every neuron could potentially connect up to roughly a thousand other neurons. Um, I won't go into the details of this, because... For, well, if you really wanted to get to grips with this, um, probably the best book, I know this might be a bit um, controversial to some people, but probably the best book to read about this is uh, The Singularity of Near by Ray Kurzweil. He's got some good estimates in there. Um, other people would say, well, no, there's a lot of stuff going on um, outside of neurons or below the neural level of complexity that is vital to consciousness. Um, like all sorts of... Uh, uh, supportive tissues that, you know, your average cognitive scientist will say, well, it's the pattern of neural function that matters. But some people would say, no, no, there, there might be other function going on in there. And so to be safe, model it down to a molecular or even an atomic level, which you know, raises, raises by orders of magnitude the amount of information you've got to handle to do the simulation. But again, it's, um, it, it shows you the strange realms we're working in when I say that's actually a conservative thing to say. Hakim Bay who uh, talks about temporary autonomous zones, which is a very artsy, abstract, poetic concept, but it's nonetheless quite powerful. His original idea was, people think about the power of the state over your life, or the power of your local government, or whatever. And they often ignore other aspects of your life that are equally powerful. Now, um, when he was originally writing, you know, there were a lot of people sort of out raving and he was really speaking to a lot of those kind of people and saying, okay, so say you're, you're out at this all-night party and for, for 24 hours, 36 hours, what goes on within that party is your reality. It's, it's more important to you than, than your council tax bill or what 
Gordon Brown, what Gordon Brown has to say this week about X, Y, or Z. And, and so he was saying that, you know, he was talking about the physical world, um, and he was saying that these zones that become more important than, than other larger political systems are temporarily uh, really important to you. Now, a lot of people tried to, then tried to say, well, what if we're talking about, um, what if we're talking about things that are permanent but virtual? And, and these things have started to come along in the last 20 years, you know, so your second lives, you get people who, for their own, um, to a certain, to certain extent, they feel that um, they may be second life or their account on a certain gaming platform or whatever is more important than paying the rent or certainly more important than what Barack Obama has to say about anything or that kind of thing. Now, as uh, these kind of technolo technologies develop, it's easy to imagine a situation where that case becomes the same, only more so where there is um, a certain disconnection between your allegiance to a particular virtual community and your allegiance to a local community or your nation or whatever. You know, at what point does Second Life start becoming more important to you than living in London? These, and the whole idea is that this is a, this is a scenario that gets taken to, um, when it gets taken to extremes, you have to really ask, what's autonomy? Are we talking about hardware that you're living on as an upload and has in some sense declared itself sovereign? Uh, and then um, you have to think about what are the, what are the technicalities of that. Is it, is it actually running on hardware that no one can find, therefore no one can do anything with it? Or is it much more likely in the world where we're living in today, it's on public networks and then you have to say, well, how do local laws apply? Now these, on the one hand, if you're thinking about yourself as an upload living on one of these systems, it's a ridiculous far future sort of scenario. But actually, it's got a lot of implications for today. Whatever you get up to on the internet is legally under the, um, under the control of wherever the server happens to reside that you do this stuff on. And you have to think about it today. Um, if you have anything to say or do online that might... Uh, not be approved of by a certain group of people, then it's a really good idea to make sure that you don't do it uh, on their soil, basically. But being on their soil now is a matter of not doing it through a server that is under their legal control. And a lot of people don't think about this kind of thing very much, but um, the ones who do realise that it's quite a pressing concern already. Okay, so utility fog, we already talked about this a fair bit. So this is, um, this is an, uh, a an idea that was given a name by Dr. John Stores Hall. So we've got these distributed nanobots that can suddenly lock into different configurations and be useful in some way. A lot of people see them away, as a way of sort of creating something like the holodeck out of um, Star Trek. So there are suddenly real objects appearing around you for you to use, and then they can dissolve when they're more than a certain point away from you. They could also be used to um, effectively create screens um, so that you see a full virtual environment. So everything in the virtual environment doesn't have to be created physically. If it's more than sort of your arm's reach away, then the illusion of it is created. So you'd have a full sense of being in this immersive environment and everything you touch is solid. And as you try to get closer to the horizon, the horizon's obviously always moving. So you'd have a sense of being somewhere other than where you really are. Um, this, a, a brief touch on sort of history, this could be a way of coming up with what Ivan Sutherland back in the back in the 60s, called the ultimate display. This was the idea of um, you know, what, is, what is the output of a computer? Before anyone had come up with a term like virtual reality, he was saying, what would be the ultimate goal of output from a computer? And he said, well, presumably it's to replicate reality to the point where these two things are indistinguishable. And he imagined, specifically, he imagined a room in which the computer could create or dissolve solid objects at will. And he actually, um, he kind of used kind of macabre examples. He, um, he, he mentioned bullets that could actually kill, that kind of thing. Um, so basically, utility fog is, um, so we've, got, we've talked about uploading as an extreme AI, we've talked about virtual autonomous zones as an extreme VR, and this is sort of the link between them. This is a, a way of, if you're still talking about stuff that's in the physical world, um, then um, utility fog can make this stuff happen around you. If it works. Okay, so um, very, very quickly, 